I think it is so fascinating to me and I will never be able to understand how people who were literally one or two years out of enslavement did these extraordinary things of setting up whole towns, hospitals, schools, newspapers, you know, mutual aid societies, people who had lived through amounts of trauma that are indescribable, not really understandable to most of us alive today, still had the wherewithal to sort of build these things. It's absolutely extraordinary. That's novelist and 2016 NEA Literature Fellow, Caitlin Greenidge. And this is Artworks, the weekly podcast from the National Endowment for the Arts. I'm Josephine Reed. We're celebrating Juneteenth with a conversation with Caitlin Greenidge about her novel, Liberty. An historical novel, Liberty is inspired in part by the true story of Dr. Susan Smith McKinney Stewart, who in 1869 became the first black female doctor in New York and then co-founded a hospital for women in Brooklyn. Greenidge sets her novel before, during, but primarily after the Civil War. And Dr. Stewart is transformed into Dr. Kathy Sampson, a widow who's raising her daughter, Liberty. Coming of age in a Black neighborhood in Brooklyn, Liberty is in awe of her formidable mother and the work she accomplishes, both as a doctor and as a stop on the Underground Railroad. But as she grows up, she rebels against the pressure to live up to her mother's expectations, to live the life her mother has mapped out for her, as a partner in her medical practice. Caitlin Greenidge parallels Liberty's struggles for autonomy to the ways Black people sought to enrich their lives and their communities in the aftermath of slavery and traces the ongoing discussions they had about the very definition of freedom. As the story moves from a free Black community in Brooklyn to the first free Black Republic of Haiti, Liberty continues to run up against gender roles, colorism, and class expectations. Here's author Caitlin Greenidge with a little more about the actual history that inspired Liberty. The novel is based on the life of Dr. Susan Smith McKinney Stewart, who was the first Black female doctor in New York State. She had a daughter who married the son of the Episcopal Archbishop of Haiti, moved to Haiti, fell in love with the country, but her marriage was very troubled. For most of her time of her relationship, she wrote letters back to her mother saying, please help me sort of get out of this situation. And finally, her mother helped her make a really dramatic escape from Haiti. She moved back to the U.S., lived there for the rest of her life, told her descendants how much she loved the country, but also for the rest of her life received these letters from her in-laws sort of saying, not only have you broken up this family, but you have brought shame to the entire project of Black liberation by ending this marriage. And yeah. I heard that story. I I did an oral history with one of um, her descendants and I was so struck by that story. And I wrote a fictionalized version with dates and names sort of changed around, but that's the basis of the story. It's an extraordinary story in and of itself. And what you do with it is really wonderful. And there's so much in your book. I'm really not sure where to start. So why don't we just begin with the book's title, which is the name of the protagonist, Liberty, because... Mm -hmm. This book is so much about not just attaining freedom, but knowing how to live in freedom. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a little heavy handed, but um, her name is Liberty. <laughs> you know, in the novel version of this, her mother and father, um, her father has passed away and her mother and father have met at lecture where sort of they're discussing uh, what should happen to free Black people in the U.S. I should say the novel's timeline goes from right before the Civil War through the Civil War and Reconstruction. And of course, before the Civil War, there was this huge question of what would happen if you were to free enslaved people, where would they live? It's taken as a given now that we would be a part of the U.S., but before the Civil War, it was a really pressing question because white people did not want to live beside free Black people and assumed that wouldn't work. And so even within Black, free Black communities, there was this question of should we stay in the U.S. or should we go? They established the country of Liberia, uh, originally in West Africa, as a colony for emancipated Black Americans. And Liberty's name is sort of an homage to that place that her father wanted to go to and her mother decidedly did not. It also speaks to the trauma of slavery because we see in characters like Ben Daisy, who 
had escaped from enslavement but had been so damaged by it he just doesn't recover mm -hmm. and you bring this up which isn't something we often think about yeah. we don't think about trauma and how it lasts not just through a person's emotional life but intergenerationally yes exactly you know i i worked for many years in black history museums that's where i first heard this story that um liberty is based on i worked for many years in black history museums particularly ones dedicated to Black abolitionists. And I was so struck by within those sort of stories of triumph and incredible bravery and courage, we often didn't talk about the real emotional toll of living through enslavement and then also the emotional toll of fighting against a structure as whole, dominating, all-encompassing as slavery was in the U.S., it was obviously difficult to be a slave, but even to be an active abolitionist took an incredible emotional toll on the Black people who did that political work. And we know that from, from reading their diaries. You know, uh, I think Sojourner Truth is probably the most famous example. She struggled with alcoholism and alcohol dependency her whole life, understandably because of the sort of intense traumas that she lived through. But when you would try to include that part of her story, oftentimes when I would try to include those parts of the story, when speaking with the public, the response was like, to talk about that is to somehow denigrate that person's memory or to somehow uh, cheapen the history to rec recognize the toll. And to me, that always felt so backwards because the struggle is part of what makes these stories part of our legacy that, that people did have these issues. People did try and reckon with trauma, came up with different coping me mechanisms, some of them helpful and sustainable that we still use today and some of them not so much that we still use today and that is a part of the larger human experience that was slavery it's not outside of human experience or human understanding those things are very much a part of humanity exactly it's like history mm -hmm. of course history influences the present how do you stand outside of history where yeah. is that place that's outside of history exactly exactly well, mothers and daughters and the complexity of that relationship is very centered in this book as well. And Liberty is an only child. Her father is dead and her mother is her world. It, it is the world to her. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is also very much a coming of age story. Remind me how old Liberty is when we first meet her. She's about seven years old at the start of the novel. Yeah. So, you know, she's really young. And I have to say, personally, I'm an only child. Mm -hmm. My father died when I was very, very young. Mm. And I really understood that that closeness you have with your mother. And then as you grow up, you have to self-define. And part of that is pushing away mm -hmm. the person who was your life. You really, really nailed that. But it's also so complicated because of who her mother is. My mother was just a mom, you know, but <laughs> Dr. Samson was a formidable woman. She was mm -hmm. exceptional. And I think if you don't mind reading a little bit, because I think the opening of the book really sets the table for who Dr. Samson is and how Liberty sees her. Of course. Sure. I'll read the first couple paragraphs. I saw my mother raise a man from the dead. It still didn't help him much, my love, she told me, but I saw her do it all the same. That's how I knew she was magic. The time I saw Mama raise a man from the dead, it was close to dusk. Mama and her nurse, Lenore, were in her office. Mama with her little greasy glasses on the tip of her nose, balancing the books, and Lenore banking the fire. This was the rule in Mama's office. The fire was kept burning from dawn till after dinner, and we never let it go out completely, even on the hottest days when my linen collar stuck to the back of my neck and the belly of Lenore's apron was stained with sweat, a mess of logs and twigs was lit up down there, waiting. When the dead man came, it was spring. I was playing on the stoop. I'd broken a stick off the mulberry bush, so young and had resisted the pull of my fist. I'd had to work for it. Once I'd wrenched it off, I stripped the bark and rubbed the wet wood underneath on the flagstone, pressing the green into rock. And I'll stop there. Again, she remembers her mother, the first sentence, I saw my mother raise a man from the dead. Mm -hmm. That is some legacy to try <laughs> to live up to. Yeah, yeah. And you know, it's, I really wanted to sort of play with that superhuman understanding of a parental figure that a small child has, 
and how in a small child's imagination that seems completely possible that your parent has some sort of say over life and death. And, you know, part of growing up is is realizing that's not the case and letting that fantasy go. You know, it's 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 a really alluring fantasy to give your parental figure much more agency in the world than you have and the, and that a normal person has because you know it takes a lot of responsibility off yourself of of having to figure that stuff out if you continually tell yourself well you know my my mother was great at everything or my mother was always able to do it and part of what is becoming an adult in the world is is recognizing the gaps in that and letting go of that narrative to make space for yourself to grow and for your parent to grow as well in 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 your relationship with them and again, in in the case of, of Dr. Sampson, she truly is an exceptional person. Mm-hmm. There are very few Dr. Sampsons that mm-hmm. are going to walk this world. Yeah. And that really complicates things so much more because Liberty is raised to be like her mother, to become a doctor. But it's not what she wants as much as she loves and admires her mother and wants her approval. Right. Yeah. Part of the novel is really looking at this narrative of Black exceptionalism that's often closely tied to Black identity in the U.S. And even Black people ourselves, we sort of oftentimes buy into the myth that only the exceptional of us are are worthy of respect and that we constantly have to prove ourselves to this level of excellence that is unsustainable for all of us. You know, if Obviously, everybody is unique, but if everyone is exceptional in in a materialistic sort of understanding of the word, that's not possible. And to expect all of us to do that is setting us up for failure and to to peg our very sort of just basic survival on being absolutely exceptional is a real torturous kind of bargain. But it's a really seductive one. You know, it's a it's a seductive one to tell yourself that you and your children are going to be the ones to sort of beat the legacy of racism in the U.S. Somehow you are going to be the exception to the rule, that somehow you'll make it so that your kid doesn't have to have to deal with it, but, you know, maybe everybody else will. That's such a seductive narrative in our culture, and it's really hard to to not respond to it. And, of course, this is then further complicated by skin color mm-hmm. because... Dr. Sampson could pass for white, Mm -hmm. which is partly why she was able to become a doctor. And Liberty takes after her father, who's much more Mm dark-skinned than than her mother. And that presents different sorts of constraints on the child. Yeah. um, One of the things that I really wanted to look at was this question of colorism, which comes up in our culture, I think, feel like every 10 or 15 years or so. What often happens when we talk about colorism is we, we talk about it in incredibly personal terms. You know, people tell the story of like, I was either too dark or too light for this particular group of people or set of people. And we don't necessarily talk about it in the ways that it structurally affects people. And we definitely don't talk about it historically. You know, what I'm so fascinated by is how subjective colorism is, even though it, it dictates, you know, really down to rates of marriage and people's earning ability and the type of health care they receive, it's still extremely subjective, you know, unless you're talking about someone who is extremely light skinned with Eurocentric features or someone who is very, very dark like I am. In the middle, there's a whole range of shades that in some contexts will be considered light skinned and other contexts will be considered dark skinned. And yet we act like these terms are set in stone. And that psychological aspect of it is so interesting to me. And I wanted to write a novel in which it's a part of the characters' lives, but it's in a, in a natural way. Uh, Liberty's mother is light enough to pass. She absolutely adores her dark-skinned daughter. She thinks her daughter is a prize, is the, sort of the best thing that has ever happened to her in the world. So the question of colorism isn't necessarily within her love or respect for her daughter, but it definitely drives a wedge between the two women because they are being fundamentally treated in very different ways as they move through the world, even though both of them are having to live through being Black women in the 19th century. They're, they're having very different experiences of what that is. You know, it's really interesting because a lot like um, Zori Neale Hurston's Their Eyes Were Watching God, we really are seeing this through the eyes of 
well, through Liberty. I mean, it's, it's definitely her eyes, but it always is happening within a black community, within a black family. Clearly there's mm -hmm. larger white oppression and white violence. There's mm -hmm. also the horrible riots, race riots in New York that we see from a distance. But the story you tell is really centered on the black community and their interactions with one another. Yeah, I wanted to, that was sort of like a formal challenge to myself was to set a novel in the 19th century with black characters about blackness in which whiteness was really going to be really peripheral. And um, they live underneath sort of the really harsh systems of white supremacy, but really the conversations are, are between black people themselves about what blackness is actually going to mean and, and how you create communities for ourselves. You know, I'd written a novel, my first novel, We Love You, Charlie Freeman, uh, which was about a black family that moves to a nearly all white town to teach sign language to a chimpanzee. And that novel was really about blackness coming right up against whiteness. What does it mean to sort of come up against whiteness in sort of this white liberal space where no one really wants to name or talk about race? It was really about those issues. And when I was touring with that book, I, I went to a high school actually in Boston and I spoke with some students who were part of Boston's busing system. So black students who were in sort of this all white school. And I spoke with one of them, she was about 15 years old. And she said, oh, this novel isn't about race. And I said, oh, what do you mean? How can you say that? And she said, well, if it was about race, then I would know who was right and who was wrong. Because whenever we have discussions about race in school, they try to make it seem like it's really cut and dry, really sort of easy. And it's good versus bad. And I thought, oh my goodness, that's such a deep understanding of all the wrong ways we have conversations like this <laughs> and all sort of the, the, the wrong ways that we try and approach this subject. And it really sort of started me thinking as I was thinking about what I was going to do next, I was thinking like, what would it mean to, to write about Black people in the U.S. and just take that part of it away? And it's still about Blackness, but why do we assume that novels about Blackness, and I, I will say this purely in a literary fiction space. I don't think this is true in other art forms, but why do we assume that novels about Blackness or novels about race are immediately about Black people and white people together, which is just so strange when you, when you actually sort of dig down into that base assumption. Well, because this is set a little bit before and during the Civil War, and then most of the novel is set after the Civil War, and it was obviously a, a very difficult time for mm -hmm. formerly enslaved people who came away with nothing. Yeah. But it was also a time of real possibilities. And I really got that from your book. And also the amount of work done by Black people for Black people was extraordinary. Yeah. Yeah. I love the Reconstruction era for that reason. I think it is so fascinating to me and I will never be able to understand how people who were literally one or two years out of enslavement did these extraordinary things of setting up whole towns, hospitals, schools, newspapers, you know, mutual aid societies, parties, just like everything, you know, and, and when, when we were talking sort of earlier about that question of trauma, you know, people who had lived through amounts of trauma that are indescribable, not really understandable to most of us alive today, still had the wherewithal to sort of build these things. It's absolutely extraordinary. And I think Reconstruction is such an interesting era because as many people have pointed out, it really does mirror our own in that there were these extraordinary moments of Black achievement. And then there were these moments of increasing white resentment, white violence, backlash, and just uh, like a fomenting of a new order of white supremacy that was going to, in a really few years, really announce itself as taking over. And because that takeover was so successful, we forget that there was that sort of brief moment of, of real possibility. You know, one of the really touching and astonishing things that I read in my research was I was reading these Black newspapers from Washington, D.C., which um, had this extraordinary explosion of a, of a Black middle class during the Reconstruction. And so there were a bunch of Black newspapers coming out of that community. And in the newspapers, they were saying things like, oh, we just have to wait for this civil rights bill to pass, 1876 civil rights bill. We just have to wait for this civil rights bill to pass. 
And within a generation, the white racists will die off because we are being educated. White people are being educated. White people are seeing what we're capable of doing. Once they see this, there's no way that racism will last past the next 15 or 20 years. It just sounds so much like the things we've been saying for the last hundred years. And I, I, you know, it, that can be depressing in one light, but it can also just really tell you where the culture was at in terms of a, a really sort of significant turning point where it did feel like that was possible. The last third of the book takes place in Haiti. Mm -hmm. Liberty marries a student, a medical student of her mother's, Emmanuel Chase, whose family is very prominent in Haiti. Mm -hmm. And Haiti had a lot of resonance for African Americans during this period. Tell me about that. And tell me about the research that you did about 19th century Haitian politics. When I was looking at the uh, story that was a historical basis for this, you know, I saw that, that their family had been connected to this Black expatriate family in Haiti, and I thought that's really interesting. And then I was doing more research, of course, sort of looking at this question of what free Black people would do in the U.S. Haiti, of course, came up again. Throughout the 19th century, Haiti was a threat that some white people saw as what, what kind of like the worst could happen if Black emancipation happened, but it was a promise to Black people. It was sort of like, this is what could be possible, um, you know, if we have freedom. Um, and of course, the turbulations of Haitian history were playing out during that whole 19th century. So people didn't necessarily know where it was headed, but they could see the promise that that Haiti had and and the fear that Haiti sort of struck in white slave owners, especially, was really potent. And so, again, when I was reading those newspapers from Washington, D.C. during Reconstruction, it's all about Haiti. They're all talking about what's happening there. They're really excited when the Haitian ambassador comes to D.C. Everybody's fighting over who's going to host him for balls. And they're talking about Haitian fashion. Like, they're, they are in it. They are part of that, following that culture. And so I just love that as a space of imagination that I don't think in the last 50 or 60 years or so we've sort of lost in African-American culture and and especially in the last couple of years when I've seen online and online discussions of the Black diaspora, there's been sort of like a nationalistic tone that's taken on that is super strange to me, where people try to make an argument that somehow slavery in the U.S. was worse than slavery in the Caribbean or people in the Caribbean didn't have slavery. Like crazy arguments go on online where I'm like, I don't even know where this is coming from, but it's clearly from a group of younger people who don't even know this history of the Black diaspora and how much our communities were in conversation with each other and how people understood from the start that organizing across national borders was a necessity to defeat white supremacy and to, and to defeat slavery in particular. Well, in your book, Liberty, we have the story of the Chase family in Haiti, and mm -hmm. suddenly we see a whole new set of complications. Mm -hmm. African-Americans who immigrated to Haiti basically assuming the role of colonizers, mm -hmm. looking down on Haitian customs, mm -hmm. culture, religion, colorism, like blooms there, mm -hmm. and a really entrenched patriarchy, not that there wasn't one and isn't one in the United States, but it, it was definitely yeah. happening there. And that was to Liberty's surprise because Emmanuel was saying, no, we're, we'll be companions. Mm hmm yeah, I was really lucky in that when I started to do this work, this historian at Vanderbilt University, Brandon Bird, published a book on Black expatriates going to Haiti during Reconstruction and after. And there was a whole movement led by Black Protestant churches to move to Haiti and convert as many Haitians as possible to different Protestant faiths. There was a real worry that democracy wasn't going to work in Haiti. Haiti wouldn't be self-governing as long as it was a Catholic country and as long as it as people there practiced voodoo. So voodoo was sort of maybe lesser known as like a quote unquote, like a brand name in the 19th century. I think sort of like throughout the 19th century, people were sort of um, making up the, the myth of it as, as opposed to how people were actually sort of having it in their lives. But there was a, a group of Black elites in the U.S. who took in all the language around U.S. nationalism, that the reason why the U.S. was so stable was because of this Protestant work ethic, like all of the, that sort of mythology around whiteness. They took that in and sort of made a Black version of that and tried to export that to Haiti and really move there and did not necessarily 
take the country in for what it was. And the letters back are really extraordinary. You know, I read this one letter from this woman who's writing about going to the markets in Port-au-Prince and seeing Haitian women in the markets. And to her, instead of sort of seeing like, this is how commerce is done here and work is done here, she writes home and she's like, I, I worry about this country because I see the women doing so much manual labor and for people to be civilized, women have to be at home. And so how can we make sure that Haitian women understand they have to be just at home all the time and it's the men who should be doing physical labor. So really just sort of like drinking wholesale from all of the worst <laughs> ideas of, of history and trying to impose it on this culture. And I just found that so fascinating um, and so heartbreaking. And also just, like I said, like a, just a part of, of history, I think in sort of that ongoing quest for a space for Black freedom that free Black people have had throughout this country, either um, setting up colonies in other countries or um, setting up all Black spaces within the U.S., there is always that tension of like how much of the larger white mainstream culture's values are we going to take with us? How much of this are we going to try and, and do, but just with Black people at the top? And is that really liberation? Is that really freedom? Or, or is this a chance to imagine something completely new and completely better? And I think that tension is ongoing. I think we have that tension today in 2021, really, in so many of our issues about what we're going to do around you know, police reform, around voting, around wealth, uh, around what it means to gain wealth within the Black community. That question is underlies all of that. And we, uh, you know, it's a, it's a continual question that we'll never really have a, a full answer for. Well, the voice of Liberty herself is so particular mm -hmm. and the pacing of the book is so particular. I mean, it has a cadence to it mm -hmm. and the language is so evocative of that time, or at least a time long ago. I mean, it was so clear. I was reading a novel that was set two centuries ago. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, I thought a lot about language. A real sort of quote that guided me was this. There's a Toni Morrison interview in Black Women Writers at Work where she talks about parabolic language. So those words that we use constantly, sort of the, the meaning has rubbed off. Words like love or peace or freedom or happiness. Words that when you, if you were just to write them on the page, they just sort of sit there because every because they're so blasé and thinking about how to arrange those words onto a page or in a sentence where you can get a reader to, to come across them as if they were brand new to come across them as if they've never heard them before and so I don't think I I'm not Toni Morrison so I did not always succeed at that but that was <laughs> that was the guiding philosophy for a lot of it to that end I read a lot of poetry as much poetry as I could I read the song of songs from the bible a lot and sort of thought of that about that for structure and image and for certain cadence of certain lines to try and get the language to feel both of that time but also not sort of like stayed or, or buttoned up in any sort of way right that deep sensuality mm -hmm. that's so much a part of that book well mothers and daughters are so central to this book and in some ways it corresponds with your own motherhood journey mm -hmm. you were birthing your daughter as you were birthing the book yeah, I found out I was pregnant on the day that I handed in the first draft, and then she was born when I handed in the edits. I went to the hospital to have her on the day I handed in the edits. And so I hadn't yet become a mother when I was writing it, so I was sort of having to imagine that part of it and think about what motherhood and mothering means. It's interesting. Well, you come, your own family, your birth family is pretty exceptional. You have a sister who's an historian, another who is a playwright, and your mother is a social worker. Mm -hmm. Tell me about growing up in that family of women. You know, I'm super close with my family, and I would say that we were given the freedom growing up to have really big imaginations. Nothing was off limits to imagine or to play around. And so much of our play with each other was based on storytelling and imagining and just um, building sort of worlds. So I feel really grateful and lucky to have had that as a small child, that that was sort of just a given. And that that intense imagination was understood as a, an asset in life and not something to be embarrassed about or, or to um, sort of set aside as you grew older. 
So was it very early on that you decided you were going to be making a life as a writer in both fiction and nonfiction? Because you're a nonfiction writer as well. I think that it was really difficult to imagine how I would make a life as a writer when I was younger. I was super aware of the economics of it and how precarious they were. And I did not want to live that life having grown up in a lot of precarity. I I did not romanticize starving artist life at all. I was not interested in that narrative. So uh, I'm right there with you. (laughs) So for me, it was always sort of like, well, how do I have that creative life while making sure that I have the security that I was did not get to always enjoy as a kid. And so I held off really on being a full-time writer for a long time or, or calling myself a, a writer for a long time. And it's really only in the last five years since I published the first book that I have consistently written this much. You know, I'm, I published my first book when I was 35. So I had a whole life of not publishing and not publicly living as a writer and definitely not making a living as a writer. So it it feels a little bit strange to claim that title now. So that's about when you were able to quit the day job and just devote yourself to writing about five years ago? Well, yeah, I, I was really lucky in that I won a writing award for my first novel. And so that felt like a, a jolt of confidence in the world that people were interested in what I had to say and that I had the space to sort of work on it. And uh, I was still, te- I still taught, I was teaching <laughs> and I was also doing my nonfiction work, but it sort of felt like, okay, there is an audience somewhere out there for the things that I'm writing and for the things that I'm interested in, which did not always feel like it was the case for the first decade that I was thinking about writing and thinking about the things that I wanted to write about. Well, you also received a 2016 NEA li- Literature Fellowship. Yes. Mm-hmm. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank what you. Did that, what did that allow you to do? That allowed me to do a lot of my research around Haiti. I was able to take the trip to Haiti with that money. I was also able to have a little bit of a cushion as I figured out the transition from full-time work to doing nonfiction work and teaching. Really, it was like another jolt of confidence to be able to do that. I cannot stress enough. You know, I'm I'm not the type of writer who writes runaway bestsellers or, or writes really super viral articles or things like that. I write things that are really idiosyncratic and, and sort of to my own weird, demented tastes. And so it's really wonderful to know that someone thinks that that has value and, and is important. And finally, tell me what you're working on now. Oh, that's a great question. Um, I During pandemic, I wrote a short story called, well, right now it's called Orgy. And it's about a, a woman who during the pandemic, she goes to a sex party in Brooklyn and she's the oldest woman there. And then she sort of has to reckon with what that means and uh, what she's doing with her life. And it was really fun to write. It's Departure from Liberty. It's set in the present day. It comes out with Scribd, uh, which is a subscription story-based service. Um, and it'll come out in July. Well, I look forward to it. Caitlin, thank you. Thank you for writing this book. I'm a pretty quick reader and I kept putting the book down because I just, I wanted to savor it. Oh, that's the best compliment. Thank you so much. (laughs) I love to hear that. (laughs) Thank you. No, it's my pleasure. Thank you. That's author and NEA Literature Fellow, Caitlin Greenidge. We were talking about her novel, Liberty. You've been listening to Artworks, produced at the National Endowment for the Arts. I'm Josephine Reed. Stay safe, and thanks for listening.